Well, it's officially official, 7 o'clock. And so uh, in uh, light of that and in light of revival and in light of it being Tuesday night, I think it's time to start. So uh, I'm so glad that you guys are here. Still got uh, lots of folks making their way in, too, so uh, that's a great deal as well. As I did last night, uh, let me remind you again tonight, because uh, this is kind of an odd time to be in church for most of us, make sure you take your cell phone out and put it on silent. I would appreciate that very much, and uh, everybody else around you would too. Uh, remember Brother Kent told us one of the things you can't do last night is turn around and look behind you. So uh, the cell phone's always going to ring behind you, and so and, you know, that's one of those things you can't do. So great to see you guys tonight. We're so excited to be in revival, and the Tuesday night version is upon us. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into the music tonight. We are celebrating the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in music. I tell you, it's always exciting to sing about the resurrection. So let's pray, and we'll get it all going. Lord, we love you, and thank you so much for loving us, for caring for us. Thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you for bringing us back tonight. Thanks for bringing uh, new uh, folks in tonight. And we just, we just are lifting this service up to you to do great, mighty, wonderful, amazing things in this sanctuary. We are expecting you, Holy Spirit, to just show up and to touch our hearts and to move in us. Begin that now as we sing and lift up our voices, praising you for being alive and being our victorious Savior. We love you and we praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and let's sing. He lives tonight. It's page 220 in your book. Words are on the screen as we sing together. Join in and sing it out. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, and salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives salvation to impart. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Oh, it sounds like you. 
you believe what you're singing tonight? How about Because He Lives? This great old song we just love to sing so much. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. God sent His Son. that pretty much gives you the whole gospel in one song. We're not going to sing the whole thing, but one day he is coming, and it will be a glorious day because of what he's done. And we sing the song one day remembering the great things that Jesus has done for us. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt amongst men, my example is he. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Bearing, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, bearing, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified, freely for Since I lead the music, I get to choose the verses that we sing. And so the third, or rather the fourth verse is, One day the grave could conceal him no longer. Boy, that's the day, isn't it? 
that's the day that made all the difference in the world and for you and me. So let's sing it, all right, with great conviction. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the storm rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is the sand death, my Lord, Trumpet. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried in carry my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glory, a Savior. The amazing thing about knowing the Lord is knowing that. He is coming for us, but we also know that he is our Lord right now, right here. He is our Emmanuel, and he is risen from the dead. Let's sing this chorus. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and he For your good singing tonight, you may be seated. We all walked away, nothing to say, they just lost their dearest friend. All that he'd said, now he was dead, so this was the way it would end. Dreams they had dreamed, not what they seemed, now that he was dead and gone. The God and the jail, the heaven and hell, how could
vanished before the sun. Death had was and life had won, for morning had come. The angel, the star, the kings from afar, Wedding the water, the wine. Now it was done. They'd taken her son, wasted before his time. She knew it was true. She'd watched him die too. She heard him call him just a man. But deep in Somehow her son would live again. Then came the morning, night turned into day. The storm was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. Aren't you thankful the devil didn't have the victory that day? Wouldn't you have loved to have been there to see the stone roll away? I mean, really, that's the part of history that I hope we can replay someday. <laughs> when the angel rolled the stone back and Jesus Christ emerged from the tomb. Amen. Victorious over death and hell and given us the victory. Mm. Well, Brother Kent... Man, I... Oh. Kent didn't blow yeah. too hard, and, and uh, Brother Kent didn't pull anything real bad. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Just a little pull. <laughs> just a little pull. And uh, I do want to remind you, just before uh, I <sighs> step aside, and he preaches that uh, every bit of the offering you put in the box tonight, which is on the Welcome Center, goes right to Ignite Ministries. Okay, tonight and tomorrow night, last two nights to be a blessing to the to his ministry. So drop that in the box if you haven't already. Okay, Brother Kent, come preach. Thank you, Brother Daniel. Well, I'll tell you concerning that offering, really me and Julie don't need the money, but uh, the people we owe sure do. And so uh, you might keep that in mind. Well, are you glad to be here tonight? Say Amen. How many, I want you to look right, I want you to look left, I want you to choose wisely. Take that person by the right hand and say, you're in the right place at the right time, right now. <clears throat> you're in the right place at the right time. Now, if you're taking the revival challenge, and the revival challenge is to be here for all five of my messages, We've only got one more to go, one more night, and this meeting will be over. And you want to plan on being here for the final night tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. I believe tonight, before we go on, though, we need to have a testimony meeting tonight. I like to have a testimony meeting, and uh, we're going to have what I call a Kent York testimony meeting. And the way the Kent York testimony meeting works is I start the testimony and you finish the testimony in five words or less. If you go over five words, we have a bouncer in the back. 
he will throw you out of the building. All right, I'm the only one going to preach tonight. But I'm going to let you come up with five words. And the way we're going to do it, we're going to start in this section and then this section and that section. You've got to hold up your hand or stand up or acknowledge that you want to give the testimony. Let me call on you and then say it good and loud just like you just won the Irish sweepstakes. All right, are you ready? The testimony goes like this. I love the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ because I love the Lord Jesus Christ because five words or less you fill in the blank who's going to be first I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he gave me second chances we're coming here I love the Lord Jesus Christ because yes He saves me every day. Amen. That's a preacher's grandson right there. Aren't you proud of him? <laughs> I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... Who's going to get it? Yes. He died for me. We're back over here. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... Yes, sir. He arose from the grave. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... He blesses me every day. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he loved, me first. he loved me first. We're back over here. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because that man put his hand up. We'll have to come back for you. I'm sorry. I'm penalizing you. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he's my Jehovah Jireh. Oh, that was four words. Great. They were big words though. All right. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he is. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he loves me. Now we're coming back to you, ma'am. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for me. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because way in the back. Because he lets me live every day. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... Who's going to get it over here? Yes, sir. He's shown me grace. Okay, we're going to have one last pass. You better get it ready. Get ready. Get them hands up. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... What? He took my sins away. That's a simple one. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... Okay, uh, throw her out, please. <laughs> I was, no, no, I'm teasing. And I'm going to pick up my back one back here. I love the Lord Jesus Christ because who had a hand back in the back? Come on, get it. Amen. And the, who's going to get the last one over here? I love the Lord Jesus Christ because... He gave us a wonderful pastor. Oh. I'd watch out for that lady. She's after something. I don't know what it is. Don't you love the Lord Jesus Christ and I? Amen. And I'll just say tonight, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight, why don't you get him before you leave the building tonight? Go out of here knowing that Jesus Christ is my King, my leader, my Savior. Let's get our Bibles out and go to the book of James, chapter number 2. James, chapter number 2. It's in the very back of your New Testament. Go to the book of James, all the way to the back. James chapter number 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 14. As soon as you find your place in God's Word, James 2, 14, let's stand and we'll honor the Bible as we read it by standing. I believe prayer is the key to any great revival meeting. And I've never deviated now in 22 years of traveling all over the world. After I read my passage, I always invite anyone that would like to to come to the altar and pray with me. We'll take a moment for prayer. Some people say, well, prayer takes a long time, Brother Kent. It's not a waste of time. 
And you're welcome to come and pray with me. You would, might say, well, Brother Kent, I'm not comfortable coming down and praying with you. Well, if you're not, then you can just be seated after we read. Or if you're physically unable, I understand. But if you would like to, you can come down and pray with me in just a minute. James chapter 2, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. I invite anyone that would like to come and join me at the altar. We're going to kneel in prayer. The remainder, you can be seated, but you're welcome to come and pray with me. Amen. Come on down and pray. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you tonight and we're so thankful that we live in a country like the United States of America. I'm thankful that we can have a church. I'm thankful we can have your word and read from it tonight as we have without any fear of persecution tonight. I want to thank you for young men and young women in uniform, some on the other side of the world tonight in cities that we can't even pronounce. But they're protecting our freedom. Thank you, Lord. And tonight we're still praying for revival in a heart. There's a man and a woman in this room tonight that they've been here ever service, but they have yet to let the word penetrate their heart. It's rolled off their back like water off a duck. I'm praying tonight your word would break their heart and bring revival. I'm praying tonight for a man or a woman or a boy or girl that's in this room that's waiting for one last thing on their spiritual calendar, and that is their heart is going to beat one last time, and they're going to go off into eternity without Jesus Christ. I'm praying for that one person in this room that needs Jesus the most. And I'm praying that tonight, during the altar call time, they would walk down to Pastor Daniel and say, I want to get saved. And tonight I know if they would come with a heart of faith and repentance, you'd save them. I pray tonight they'll listen as never before. And they'd leave this property tonight knowing that their destination, their eternity is sure. <clears throat> Dear God, give me preaching power. Let me be your man tonight. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for coming and praying. Tonight I read to you from the little book of James. 
I don't know how many of you know that James is by far the most controversial book in all the Bible. Many of the early church fathers did not want the book of James to be in our Bible. You know why? Because they believe that the teaching of James that we read tonight is in direct contradiction to the teaching of the Apostle Paul. You see, Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And tonight we've already read James, and James said faith without works is dead. Some of the early church fathers said, We can't have James and Paul in the same book. They don't agree with each other. Even Martin Luther himself was not a proponent of the book of James. But I'm happy to tell you tonight that James is in our Bible. You know why? Because when they dissected the book of James and they studied the book of James, they found that all James was saying is when a person gets saved, it changes the way they live. And then Paul and James are in total agreement because Paul said in the book of Corinthians, he said, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And James and Paul are in total agreement. But tonight in this passage, James tells us that there is a faith that just doesn't work. There's a faith that just doesn't work. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> Have you ever got something that didn't work before? Oh, doesn't that just burn you up? Did any of you ladies ever order the salad shooter off the TV set? You remember that thing? It was supposed to be like, salad shooter! And it was supposed to shoot carrots like a machine gun. You remember that? Never did work. It made carrot mush every time I tried it. That's why they don't sell it anymore. It didn't work. My wife one day was watching TV and they had these steamers. Have you ever seen them? And you screw the top off and you put a little spoon of water and a little dash of salt and screw the top on and it was supposed to shoot all this steam out. And she said, Kent, you need one of those. You can carry it in your suitcase and you could steam your suits when you go on the road. And, and Brother Daniel, it was such a good deal. She got two of them. Never worked. Never made an ounce of steam. She said, don't worry, it's a money-back guarantee. We're still looking for those guys in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I hate it when something don't work. I pastored a church years ago out in Borger, Texas, in the panhandle of the high plains of Texas. It was a Monday morning. It was kind of like today. It was a beautiful bluebird sky. It wasn't a cloud in the sky, and I drove to my office early Monday morning. The way it worked at Borger, I would parallel park on the street, and then there was a sidewalk that went to my office door, which would be about where that door is in the corner over there. And that morning I pulled up in my car and I walked around the nose of my car and over here out of my eyesight, out of my eye shot over here, I heard something go chinkity chank. Chinkity chank. Now I've always got to stop right here and make a confession. I do not want to make this confession. But if I'm going to tell this story, I've got to make a confession. I don't want to make it because we're going to have men that are going to laugh at me and some of you kids are going to laugh and make fun and some of you are going to call me a baby and a sissy and a panty waist and I don't like that. Don't call me that. But I've got the worst problem that a preacher could ever have. It's the most hideous problem that a preacher could ever have and I got it. And I really don't want to tell you what it is. Yeah, I do. If I'm going to tell this story, I've got to tell it. I'm, I'm, I'm scared of dogs. Mm -hmm. What are you laughing at? I didn't say I hate dogs. I don't hate dogs. I am scared of dogs. 
If I go out on visitation and they've got a chain link fence around their yard, Brother Daniel, I don't open that gate and walk up to the porch. <laughs> I grab that gate. Here, boy! Here, boy! I'm looking for a dog bone. I'm looking for a dog path. If I think there's a dog in that yard, I'm not going in there. And if I go up to a house and they got a big old dog in there barking and clawing around, I, 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 I don't go in there. I bow my head and pray. Dear Lord, I hope these people are saved. Because if it's up to me, they're going straight to hell because I'm not going in there. I stick my track in the fence and I leave. I am scared of dogs. Do you understand me? And that morning in Borger, Texas, I got up to the nose of my car and I heard something over here go chingity chink. And I turned and standing right in the middle of the road was the biggest, meanest, ugliest looking bulldog you'd ever seen in your life. He had slobber running out of his jowls. And that chinkity chank, he had a chain around his neck that was dragging 10 feet behind him. Now that wasn't a chain like you would chain a dog up with. It's a chain like you would pull a pickup truck with. And every time he took a step, that chain went chinkity chank, chinkity chank. Now, a little old lady got me at church one day, and she said, Brother Kent, let me help you with your dog problem. Number one, don't ever look a dog right in the eye. Well, it was too late. Me and that dog were looking right at each other. <laughs> and you know, dogs have a dog sense. They know who's scared of them, and I could see it in his eye. He knew I was scared of him, and I thought, don't look at him. And I turned toward that office door. That little old lady said, one other little detail, Brother Kent. Don't ever run from a dog. So I'm thinking, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to run. But, but I'm walking as fast as I can to that door. And I took off for that door, and I could hear him coming. Chinkity chank, chinkity chank, chinkity chank. He was right behind me like jaws right behind me. Ah, ah. Now I got a problem. I'm the first one to the office. That door's locked. The key's in my pocket. And boy, I'm digging for that key, and I'm trying to get it out. He's coming right behind me. I'm trying to remember, do the little bumps go up or the little bumps go down? You know, you can use a key a thousand times, but at the moment of truth, you can't remember which way to turn that key. And I'm not going to have time to turn this key over. It's one shot. He's right behind me. And I determined that the little bumps went up, and I lined that thing up, and I ran up, and it went right in the lock, and I thought... Woo! I'm going to make it! And I turned it. And right when I turned it, it snapped off in the lock. I remember I didn't even move. I just stood there and looked at the butt of that key. I waited for the impact. I thought it's going to be rump roast today. And I stood there at that door looking at that key and all of a sudden that bulldog come up around me and he put his head right there on my leg and slobber ran right down my pants leg. And he looked up and went, Rrr. I was about to have a heart attack. I thought all I got to do is get back to my car and I'm turning around with this dog on my leg right here. And an old beat-up Pontiac pulled up. It was a rust bucket, and the top was peeling. And an old lady was in the front seat sucking on a cigarette. And she rolled the window down, and she yelled, You better get home as fast as you can! And I said, Lady, I'm trying to! <laughs> I think it was her dog, but anyway. <laughs> you say, Brother Kent, why do you tell such a silly story? Well, I'll tell you why I told that silly story. Because if I've got a key, I want it to open the door. When I need to get in the door, I want that key to work. And I'm going to tell you tonight, I don't care what you call your faith. I don't care how you describe your faith. I don't care what denomination your faith is. If your faith does not open the gates of heaven when you die, you've got a faith that don't work. I had the great privilege one day of leading an 83-year-old Jehovah Witness man to the Lord. And you know what that old gentleman told me? He said, Brother Kent, the Jehovah Witness have a lot of interesting doctrines and a lot of neat literature. But they never, ever gave me anything to die 
with. I'm going to tell you right now, folks. When your heart beats one last time and you draw the last breath of life, you better make sure you got a faith that works. And tonight in this passage, James shows us three kinds of faith that don't work, and that's what I want to talk to you about for the next few moments. The first one I see right there in verse number 14. He says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith? Do you know what? A faith that don't work is a faith that is merely a say-so faith. You see, there is a lot of people. In fact, brother, brother Daniel, I'd really, I have my own statistic that 99.9% of every person you talk to, if you ask them if they're a Christian, they will say they're a Christian. We talked to a man today at the golf course, and he said that he was a Christian. People love to say that they're a Christian. And you know what? Just because you say you're a Christian don't mean you are a Christian. I met that one guy one day. I was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I was out knocking doors, and he came to the door, and I said, hey, I'm out talking about the Lord today. wonder if you know the Lord. He goes, I don't even believe there is a God. I said, you don't? I've been looking for you. He said, you're looking for me? I said, yeah, your name's in the Bible. He said, my name is in the Bible? I said, yeah, look here. And he leaned over my shoulder and I flipped to Psalm 53, 1 and it says, and the fool saith in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> now, I've never used that approach again <laughs> because, boy, he got mad at me. But you know what? Almost everybody you talk to will say that they're a Christian. And just because you say tonight that you're a Christian doesn't mean you are a Christian. Just because you slept in a garage one night, it don't make you a car. Now, there's somebody in the building, and of course, there's always someone that this is the only Bible verse they know how to quote from heart, and it's the verse that says, Brother Kent, judge not that ye be not judged. And you know what? That is a Bible verse. And they're exactly right. I have no right to judge a person whether they're saved or lost. I have no right to judge you whether you're saved or lost because I only believe that God and you know whether you're saved or not. But you see, James here says that when a person does get saved, their life begins to produce good works. The Apostle Paul actually called it fruit. Fruit in the limbs of the tree of your life should look like Christian fruit. You see tonight, if you truly are a Christian, there ought to be some dead giveaways in your life that show people that you are a Christian. There ought to be some fruit. You say, like what? Well, I kind of think if you're a Christian... Every once in a while, you like to talk about the Bible. If you're a Christian, you like to have a conversation about the Lord and souls and doctrine. Brother Daniel, I pastored three churches over an 18-year period. I had wonderful people, but I had some people that I never once had a spiritual conversation with. Oh, we could talk about resurfacing the parking lot. We could talk about the Dallas Cowboys. We can talk about Bill and Hillary. But we never once had a spiritual conversation. You see, if you're truly a Christian, there ought to be some fruit that shows you're a Christian. And you want to know one of the greatest fruits? 1 John chapter 5 says, If you're truly a Christian, you love the brethren. You know what that means? That means if you're really a Christian, you love Christians. And if you know they're meeting in a building down the street at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and at 6 o'clock Sunday night and 7 o'clock Wednesday night, you know what you do? You go down there because you love to be around people you love. I met my wife Julie when I was a student at Baptist Bible College. I went to school from 7.30 in the morning till 12.30 in the afternoon. At 12.30, I went to work at a place called Service Merchandise. Did y'all ever have any of those down here in Texas? Never was a really good idea. It was a catalog showroom. 
You went in, you saw the item, they wired it to the back, and some idiot in the back put it on a conveyor belt, and it came out to you. Remember that? Now, well, that was me. I was the idiot in the back. <laughs> I worked till 9 o'clock at night. At 9 o'clock, I drove directly to Julie's house. Her mom and dad lived in Springfield, Missouri. I'd drive around to the back door and go in the kitchen door. Julie had four little brothers, and anything she could say from those four boys eating, she'd have it on a plate on that table in the kitchen. There'd be a sandwich, there'd be a piece of pie, there'd be a glass of tea. Whatever she could save, she'd have it on that plate. And I'd go down there, and we'd sit down at that kitchen table, and she'd get on one side, and I'd get on the other. <laughs> we'd just make goo-goo eyes at each other. <laughs> you say, we're married, and we don't hardly talk anymore. I don't remember us talking much back then. We just... <clears throat> We just wanted to look at each other. <laughs> Our romantic conversation was like this. <laughs> Good sandwich. <laughs> and she'd say, well, I'm glad you like it. And I'd say, well, I'm glad that you're glad that I like it. <laughs> then I'd, Good tea. <laughs> and I'd eat that sandwich and drink that glass of tea. And then we'd sit there and hold hands and just look at each other. Now, when I went to Baptist Bible College, we had a curfew. On weeknights, you had to be in your dormitory at 1030. When I went to Baptist Bible College, you miss your curfew by one minute, they would kick you out. They would kick you out. There was no leniency at all. Miss your curfew by one minute, I will kick you out. They're a little more lenient up there today. I really think you could probably hold up a liquor store and they'd talk you through it today. <laughs> when I was there, miss your curfew by one minute and they'd kick you out. And I had it time perfect. Oh, I could leave Julie's house at 10.26 p.m. I could get on Kearney Street. I could catch seven green lights in a row. I would already have my car door popped open as I pulled on the parking lot. I would jump out of that car and run with everything I had. And some nights, whoo, I made it with one second to spare. You say, brother, can't. Why didn't you leave 20 minutes early and take your time? Well, I loved her. And I wanted to spend every minute I could with Julie. But you know, I meet people that tell me they're a Christian. And as soon as they get here to church, Brother Daniel, you know the first thing they're worried about? When are we going to get out? In fact, some of you tonight are wondering, I wonder when he's going to shut up tonight. As uh -huh. soon as you get here, you want to get out. As soon as you get here, you can't wait to get out of that car and get out. There's some people during the closing prayer, their leg starts going up. In You know what? If you love the brethren, you're not in a hurry to get away from them. Because if you love people, you love to be around them. In fact, tonight, what was it like coming to the revival tonight? Did you come home from work or did you come home from school and go, Yeah, we're going to revival tonight. Or was it kind of like, uh, 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 like going for a root canal? I had to come. My mama said I had to come. My wife said I had to come. You know what? Maybe you've got a faith that don't work. Maybe you've got a faith that's merely a profession. But you have no possession. Secondly, he says there in verse number 17... He says, if a brother or sister, or verse 17, even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. You know the second kind of faith that don't work is a faith that never produced a spirituality. You see, we got a lot of people today that have got a counterfeit faith. It's counterfeit, yeah. And I want to talk about counterfeit faith in just a minute, but before I talk about counterfeit faith, let me talk about true faith. Let me make it very clear to you tonight. That true saving faith is faith in Jesus Christ and nobody else. True saving faith is putting your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard someone make this statement? 
it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. It does matter what you believe. I do not believe in gravity. We'll go up in an airplane and step out the door. <laughs> when you hit the ground, you will believe in gravity. And you know what? There is only one way. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. There's only one name given amongst men where we must be saved, and that's the name Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ and no one else, that's the only way to have true faith. And I'll go one step further. I believe that faith is a simple childlike faith. Do you realize getting saved isn't hard? You don't have to know doctrine. You don't have to quote scriptures. You don't have to get on the platform and sing a special. All you've got to understand is that I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. Jesus died on an old rugged cross. He was buried and on the third day rose again. And he did that to take away my sins and call upon the name of the Lord. That's how a person gets saved. It's a simple faith that even a child can understand. Do you remember when the little kids came to Jesus? What did the apostles say? You kids get away and leave Jesus alone. You're bugging him. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, suffer not or do not prevent these children from coming unto me because such as these are the kingdom of heaven. What did he mean? Did he mean heaven's going to be full of kids? And you're like, oh no. I didn't know that. We'll go crazy up there. No, that's not what it means, but I do want you to understand that in our world, many children die before they ever get to an age of accountability, especially in third world countries. All of those kids are in heaven. Mama, did you ever lose a baby or have a miscarriage? That baby's in heaven. Let me go one step further. The millions and millions of babies that have been murdered through abortion Every one of those babies are in heaven. Some of you are like, oh, no. We'll be up there changing diapers all day long. No. The Bible says that in heaven we'll have a perfect body. I've got 14 grandbabies. I'm expecting number 14 in December, and I love babies. And, oh, they're so cute, and they're little cushy, and they're mushy. And I love babies, but you know what? Their bodies are adorable, but they're not perfect. You lay a baby on the floor, they'll just... They won't get up and make a sandwich or nothing. They'll just lay there and die. You know why? Because their little body is imperfect. See, the Bible says that in heaven we'll have a perfect body. Many theologues believe that in heaven we'll all be 33 and a half years old. And you say, why 33 and a half years old? Well, that's how old Jesus was when he was the perfect Lamb of God. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I do not believe there will be any babies in heaven. They're going to grow up into adulthood. We also have a misconception about grandma in heaven. Some people are like, well, I can't wait to get to heaven and see my granny. <laughs> and you really believe the first day in heaven, she's going to come down the streets of gold, honey, I'm 130 years old. Granny doesn't want to be granny for eternity. I got news for you, grandmas and grandpas. You're going to young up in heaven. Isn't that going to be neat to see a foxy grandma in heaven? You're going to be like, Granny, look at you. <laughs> you know what? Babies are going to grow up. Old folks are going to young up. And Brother Daniel, we're going to have a perfect body. You're all going to look just like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some of you are close. <laughs> yeah. No, when he says such as these are the kingdom of heaven, he doesn't mean that kids are going to be full of heaven. No, what he means is the only way to come to Jesus is with a simple childlike faith. Can you have a simple faith tonight? Then you know enough to be saved. I have five kids, and oh, I'll tell you, these boys, when they're little, they are dumber than a stump. <laughs> My oldest son, Andy, I could put him on the roof of the house when he was two years old and go, Come on, Andy, jump. Daddy will catch you. He'd just, Woo! He'd step right off. I'd catch that kid with one foot, put him up there, he'd do it again. 
Today, AJ is 39 years old. I could put AJ on the roof and go, come on, AJ, jump. Daddy will catch you. I'm not jumping over there. And he's smart, too, because I'll step back and let that big lug hit. <laughs> you know what he's lost in 37 years? That little simple faith that he had in his daddy that if daddy said it, I could do it. And I'm going to tell you tonight, it just takes the faith of a child to accept Jesus. That is true saving faith. Anything other than that is counterfeit. Now let's talk about the counterfeit faiths. You want to know the biggest one? Well, it's right up there. It's that hole in the wall right up there under that screen. There's a tank of water in there. It's called a baptistry. Do you know there's a lot of people that think they're saved because they've been baptized? I met a lady one day and she said, I've been baptized five times. Well, I don't know if you know ever tadpole in that tank by first name. Water does not save you. We get baptized to show what took place in our heart. The Bible says it's a show of a good conscience toward God. And let me make it very clear to you. Baptism is something that takes place after you get saved. You might have got christened as a baby. You might have got sprinkled. You might have got poured. You might have got dunked. If any of those happened before you got saved, you didn't get baptized. You just got wet. And there's a few of you in this building tonight, you need to walk down to this pastor and say, Pastor, I got my baptism out of order. I need to be scripturally baptized because God's not going to bless your life if you're out of order. He believes in the order. But there's some in this building tonight, you actually think you're going to heaven because you got baptized. There is no saving power in water. We got a table right here. <coughs> it says, this do in remembrance of me. I would imagine a few times a year, y'all pull the flowers off and put crackers and grape juice up here. We call it the Lord's Supper. You know, there's some people, if they think they're saved because they've had Holy Communion. They've had the Lord's Supper. There's no saving power in crackers and grape juice. We do that to remember the death and blood of Jesus Christ. The cracker represents his body. The juice represents his blood. There's no saving power in the Lord's Supper. It's counterfeit. Where's it at? Oh, here it is. The next one. Holy, holy, holy altar clipboard. Here it is. It holds the holy altar decision card. There are some people that think they're saved because they came down front. They checked box number one, salvation. I'm saved, I'm saved. I joined the Broadway Baptist Church. Now, I'm not against bookkeeping. This is good bookkeeping. But I really believe there's some people that are going to stand before God one day and go, here's my card. I went down to the altar. And he's going to say, I never knew you. There's no saving power in any church. There's no saving power with just walking to an altar. And I hate to say it, in too many churches I've seen people walk to the altar and instead of getting down on their knees and praying with them and having them call upon the name of the Lord, they set them down and they fill out a card. There's no saving power in a card. It's counterfeit. And if you're trusting in any of those things, you probably got a faith that doesn't work. And then thirdly, and I'm done. Go down to verse 19. I love verse 19 because verse 19 really proves to me that God's got a sense of humor. He says in verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God? <laughs> Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You know what verse 19 is saying? <gasps> you believe in God? Whoopee. So does the devil. Wow. I got a news bulletin for you. This is a Fox News alert. 
If all it takes to go to heaven is a belief in God, the devil's going to heaven with us. Because not only has the devil met God, he believes in God. You say, brother, can't the devil's not going to heaven? Yeah, maybe you're not either. Because it takes more than just an intellectual agreement with the facts. One writer years ago said, many people will miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the distance from your brain to your heart. You had it here, but you got nothing here. Now I'm about to say something to you, and I do not want you to take it wrong. I'm not lying, I'm telling you the truth. I want to thank Broadway Baptist for letting me attend your church services Sunday morning. Because Sunday morning when I attended church with you here at Broadway, I completed a perfect lifetime attendance record in church. I have never missed a Sunday of church in my entire life. Next month on October the 28th, that's my birthday, I will have completed 62 years of perfect attendance if I live till next October 28th. Now, I'm not pulling your leg. You can ask my mother. I was born on a Tuesday, and I was in church the first Sunday of my life. I was that kid at church that everybody knew by the time I was seven years old. That kid had never been sick on a Sunday. That kid had been in Sunday school every Sunday for seven years. The first Sunday in January, my dad got in the pulpit. He was the pastor. Now, some of you kids are going to go, Well, <laughs> no wonder you had a perfect attendance. Your daddy was the preacher. Well, you kids listen to me and you get it straight. My dad never once made me go to church. Do you hear me? He had a little agreement. If you wanted to eat, you go to church. <laughs> it was totally optional. And you can see I was extremely faithful. Mm -hmm. When I was seven years old, Dad got in the pulpit the first Sunday in January and said, if you'll come to church for one year, we're going to give you a button that says one year perfect attendance. I said, I'm going for it. That first year, Brother Daniel, 35 people lined up across the front of our building. 35 people had not missed one Sunday, and Dad come down and pinned pins on all of us. He said, if you'll do it again, there's a little bar that hangs underneath it. It says two years. I said, I'm going for it. The second year, there was 15 of us. We had not missed a Sunday. Dad said, there's a little barge. Said, three years. I said, I'm going right. That year, there was five of us. Next year, there was a fourth year pin bar. Four years. I said, I'm going right. It was me and Don O'Brien, head deacon of the church. Then there was five years, me and Don O'Brien, head deacon of the church. And then I'll never forget that Sunday morning. Brother Don was a wheat farmer. His wheat was in the field. He called our house at 1217 Choctaw early Sunday morning. My dad took the call on a black rotary telephone. I was 14 years old. I was standing in the middle of the living room floor. And I heard him say, Brother Don, thank you for calling. We'll miss you, but we're glad you called. Bye-bye. I remember my dad turned to me and said, Kent, that's Brother Don, and he can't make it to church this morning. I remember my reaction. Yeah! Another one bites the dust. The next year, I walked up there, and they pinned seven years of perfect attendance on my chest. I wore the pen every Sunday. I walked around that church building like a decorated general. I, how do you like my pen? I am the most faithful person in my church. You say, well, your dad was there. No, dad got the mumps when he was 40 years old. Missed two Sundays, sorry. <laughs> I 
was the most faithful person in my church. But I got to tell you something. I wasn't even saved. You say, Brother Kent, weren't you paying attention? Yeah, I was paying attention. I knew all the stories. I knew about Adam and Eve, and I knew about Jacob and Isaac, and I knew about Jesus and his apostles. I knew it all here, but I had nothing here. And it came a Sunday night, and I was wherever a good preacher's kid is on Sunday night. I was on the back pew. In fact, we had an aisle that went to a side door. I was on the pew behind the aisle. I was as far back in that building as you could get. I had known since the age of eight that I needed to be saved and every service was horrible because I was under such conviction. And it's tough when you're the most faithful person in church. <clears throat> I went to every revival, every mission conference, every youth camp, every service. I was there. And I don't remember what my dad preached that night, but I remember the Holy Spirit of God was dealing with my heart and I needed to be saved. And I had a standard routine. I looked at my shoes because I couldn't look up. If I looked up, I'd start crying. So I looked at my shoes. There I was, 14 years old, back there looking at my shoes. And all of a sudden, a pair of shoes appeared in front of me. I didn't even look up. I just said, somebody's standing right there in front of me. Who is it? Old brown wingtips. He had striped pants, a watch chain, a psychedelic tie that wide at the bottom. Oh, I know who that is. It was old Brother Wilkes. Brother Wilkes was a retired preacher and he couldn't pastor anymore and they joined our church. Him and his wife sat right here on the second pew. I didn't know it, but during that invitation, during that invitation, he got up and he walked back that aisle to me. Now, Brother Wilkes was an old-fashioned preacher. We called him a wind-sucking preacher. Did you ever hear a wind-sucking preacher before? In between every phrase, he went, <gasps> kind of like that. It scared us, but in his day, it was good preaching. And that old man walked back to me. He was the same height as I was at 14. He had a little bald head. His glasses were just like wires. The lenses was like the bottom of two Coke bottles. And I remember I looked up into those Coke bottle eyes and he took his hand and put it on my shoulder just like that. And he said, Kent, wouldn't you like to get saved tonight? And I had fought it for six years. And that night I said, yeah, I would. And he said, let's go. And I took that old man's hand and we stepped out in the aisle. As a 14-year-old boy, there was two things I was terrified of. Number one, that all the kids my age would laugh at me if I went to the altar. Not one kid laughed at me that night. They were glad I got saved. The second thing that terrified me was if I went down there and got saved, all the old ladies would want to come down and pinch my cheeks. Not one old lady pinched my cheeks that night. They were glad I got saved. In fact, when we stepped out in the aisle... Everybody on the back pew turned and looked down to see who was coming. And when they saw it was me, everybody on the back pew started crying. They would prayed for me. And we took two more steps and the next pew started crying. That church cried from the back to the front. The guy on the front row didn't know what was coming down the aisle. And me and Brother Wilkes went right over here in front of the organ and we knelt down on some old red carpet on a step there at the altar. And I'm going to tell you, Brother Daniel, I went down lost and I came up saved. I moved it from here to here. I got a faith that worked. Some of you tonight, I can tell the way you're looking at me. Brother Kent, you're a fanatical preacher. Well, I've met a fanatical preacher, and I'm not one of them. 
I met a preacher one day that told me, I don't believe you're truly saved if you don't know the exact minute on the clock that you got saved. Do you believe that? I don't believe that. Who can remember the exact minutes? I met another Christian one day that said, well, I don't think you're truly saved if you don't know the date on the calendar that you got saved. I don't believe that either. Not everybody can remember the date they got saved. But you know what I do believe? I believe if you, tonight if you're truly saved, you'll never forget the place where you got saved. The place. My daughter Elizabeth, she's 26 now, but when she was a little girl, she used to love to play with sidewalk chalk. About the size of that handkerchief. And if I'd get a stick of Lizzie's sidewalk chalk and bring it to Broadway tonight... I truly believe that if you're saved, you could come get this stick of chalk and you could go someplace on the face of this earth and you could draw a circle on the ground and you could get in that circle and say, this is where I got saved. For some of you, it might be right here in this building, right at this altar. For some of you, it may be in another state, in another church. For some of you, it may be out here in the mesquite bushes on the hillside. You see, it doesn't matter where you draw the circle. Can you draw a circle? You see, there's a few of you, if I gave you the stick of chalk, you know what you'd do? I've just always loved Jesus. No, it don't work like that. I wasn't always married. One day I walked in a church building. I said, I do. And when you say, I do, you did. You got married. And I will never forget that Sunday night in April when I walked down that aisle and I can go to that spot today and I can draw a circle and I can get in that circle and say, this is where I got saved. How about you tonight? Can you come get the chalk? Can you draw that circle? Can you go to that place? Because if you can't, I just imagine you got a faith that doesn't work. And in just a minute, we're going to hold an altar call. And if you'd walk down to this good pastor and just say, I want to get saved tonight. I want to draw my circle tonight. I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ tonight. We'll have somebody kneel with you with a Bible. And tonight we can draw your circle right here in this building. And you can walk out of this building tonight going, Praise God, I've got a faith that works. Would you stand with me tonight? I'm going to ask that every head be bowed and every eye closed. Nobody talking or moving tonight. Let's just be very still. We'll just be a minute longer. We've got men with Bibles. We've got ladies with Bibles. They're trained. They're here to pray with you and help you. Our pianist is going to play very softly just as soon as she finds her place. And then after I have prayer, we're going to have a song of invitation. We're going to invite you to walk to this altar. But just before we do, I'd like to pray for you if you'd let me. Tonight you would say, Brother Kent, I don't think I've got a faith that works. I don't think I've got a faith that will open heaven's gate if I died tonight. And Brother Kent, I wish you'd pray for me. And I'm going to tell you how I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to pray that you get saved someday. I'm going to pray that you come tonight and you settle it among friends tonight. I want every chin tucked low so that I can tell your head is down. And tonight, if you'd like me to pray for you for your salvation, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up. I'm just going to look across this building a couple of times and I'm going to ask you just to lift your head up high and look at me and when our eyes meet you can put your head right back down but by looking me in the eye 
You're saying, Brother Kent, I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm saved. I don't think I've got a faith that works. Would you pray for me tonight? I'm going to start on my left hand over here and work across. Would you like me to pray for you? Just lift your head up and look at me. I'm just going to look the best I can with these old eyes. Just lift that head and just look at me. I just want to pray for you. I'm coming across to the center section. Are you in that center section? Could you just lift your head and look at me? Brother Kent? Yeah, I see you. Thank you. Yes, I see you. Thank you. Brother Ken, I don't think I got a faith that works. Takes courage. Who else? Just lift your head and look at me. You can put your head right back down. Yeah, I see you. Thank you. Oh, it takes courage. I respect that so much. I'm still in the center section. Who else? Just lift it up. Look at me. You can put your head right back down. I just want to pray for you tonight. I'm moving over here to my right hand by the piano. Is there anybody in this section? Just lift your head and look at me. I just want to pray for you tonight. Maybe tonight there's a Christian here and you'd say, Brother Ken, I do have a faith that works. I am saved. I can draw a circle. But the fruit in my life is not what it ought to be. I know it's not right. And tonight it dealt with me about my life, my works. And Brother Ken, I wish you'd pray for me. How many Christians are like that tonight? Could hold your hand up high for just a minute. Brother Ken, God dealt with me tonight about my Christian life. Yes, yes. Thank you. You can put them down. Heavenly Father, I come to you first tonight for these that looked at me. Three or four tonight looked me in the eye. And I'm praying tonight that they'd go one step further. They'd walk down to Pastor Daniel and just say, I want to draw my circle tonight. I want to leave here with a faith that works tonight. I'm praying, Lord, for their souls. I know you'll save them if they'll come with a heart of faith and call upon your son's name. And then, Lord, for Christians all across the building, their fruit's wrong. Break their heart. Bring them to this altar to recommit and rededicate themselves to bear fruit, <coughs> to have good works that shows their faith. Dear God, this is your invitation. You take it, you bless it. If you can't do it, nobody can. We give it to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look up here and listen to me real quickly. You that lifted your head and looked at me, you know who you are. I've been there. I know how scary it is. You need to be saved tonight. You need to settle it tonight. When our sister sings that very first word, Come down and see Pastor Daniel and he'll have somebody pray with you tonight. You know who you are. Why don't you step out and come on this first word. Make up your mind. She sings that first.